Good evening and welcome to our online service. We are so honored that you are watching with us. We'd love to get to know you, so be sure to leave a comment below and let us know where you're watching from and who you're watching with. You can even drop an amen or some praise hand emojis when Pastor Steph says something you connect with. Also, if you are ever in our area, we'd love for you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. All right, well, I'm so excited about tonight's message, so let's jump right in. You know, going into today's message, I had about a full page on what faith is. We've been in this foundation series and we've been talking about faith and I always, the teacher in me always feels the need to recap, but I feel like this morning there's no need to recap faith, what we've been talking about. I feel like we have seen faith in action today already. I mean, the way that you guys came into this place today through worship, I could feel the faith in this room the testimony that Wes shared this morning about what faith and the power of your words and the power of trusting God looks like in your life, being able to have faith in your finances, and then seeing these guys up here, these next students, like Pastor Bunk said, it was really just a dream. It was an original dream that was given in 1979, and like Pastor Bunk said this a couple years back, we... Uh, this was something stirring in my spirit, but I was kind of sitting on just this at the right time. It seems like we had a lot going on that year, and we ended up going to Belize, and God just kind of spoke a word through some man I'd never met, and I knew that word was God saying, it's time. And so like Pastor Bunk said, just seeing your faces up here, seeing these kids up here, and the faith that these kids have taken to go, God, I'm going to dedicate a year of my life to the kingdom. Before I start going on my own way, doing my own thing, God, I'm going to dedicate this year for you and see what you can do, God. So we've seen faith arise in this room today. So I'm going to skip all of page one, and I'm just going to go to my first point this morning, and that faith has the power to design your life. That faith has the power to design your life. And, and Jesus spoke about faith so often in the Bible. In fact, I want to start with a passage out of Mark this morning, chapter 11. And this is Jesus speaking here to his disciples. And it says, then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your mind. Over the past few weeks here, we've been discussing about faith and the power of faith. But this morning, I kind of want to take a turn and I want to talk about something that might be sneaking up us on us all to kind of paralyze our faith. And that's what Jesus was talking about in this verse here. In verse 23, he says, but you must really believe and have no doubt in your heart. Everyone say no doubt. No doubt, banned from the 90s, no doubt. Everybody have no doubt in your life. And I was thinking about something that paralyzes your faith and that's, and that's doubt. And, and what really is doubt? Well, I think doubt is a thought that goes against my faith. I think sometimes doubt can be shown in my life as worry or anxiety or fear or stress. Sometimes worry and fear just comes out as anger in our lives. So doubt is really anything that's taking that faith in our life and, and taking it away from us. And when I begin to think about with worry, worry is just a counterattack to faith. And I was thinking about the scripture that we used last week out of Hebrews chapter 11. And it says this, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I begin to think about worry just being the counter attack, the counter opposite, kind of the ugly, evil stepsister, if you will, for faith. Because I thought about that scripture, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. And I thought you could just easily insert, now worry is the substance of things we don't hope for. Worry is when we put our faith and our trust in the evidence of things that we haven't seen. So worry is much like faith. It's just putting your faith in what you don't hope for instead of what you do hope for. Worry is faith, but in a negative future. Good. It's just faith in a negative future. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to have faith in a negative future. If I'm going to have faith and I'm going to be putting forth the energy for expectancy in the unknown, I want it to be a good story. Are y'all with me? I want it to be a good unknown, not a, not a bad unknown. And I, and I heard this quote and I like it so much. It says, most of the biggest problems we ever face are the ones that never come. Most of the biggest problems we ever face are the ones that never come the needless worry, the needless anxiety, the needless frustration that we spend hours and hours and hours on end 
worrying about that thing and putting all of our energy, all of our investment, all of our focus, all of our prioritization on something that will never even happen in our life. And worry, it really is, it's just the ugly sister of faith. Worry is faith in the wrong thing. And I think that's why Jesus talked about worry often. In fact, one of his most famous messages he ever delivered was the Sermon on the Mount. And I wanna read to you out of Matthew this morning when Jesus addressed worry. He says this, he says, that is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing, yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. So why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly father knows all your needs. So seek first the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will bring about its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And that was the words of Jesus on worry. He says, don't even worry about tomorrow. Worry, worry in itself is a problem. Worry does a couple things this morning that I wanna to talk to you guys about. Worry is really useless. And that's what Jesus is saying in this passage. He says, don't waste any of your energy on, on worry. Worry is really useless. Worry does a few things in our life. First off, worry steals our peace and our purpose for today. It steals our peace and our purpose for today. How many of you have ever been in a situation where it just surrounds your thoughts, it all consumes you? And it's like your peace in that day is gone because of worry, but your purpose in that day is gone because of worry. It's so hard to focus on even the moment that's going on. That's the second point, is it disrupts productivity and it places us in just a stale loop. It's hard to be productive when you're worried about something because your mind is, is absorbed into some other situation, to some other what ifs, to some other thing, and it's very hard to be present in that moment. The third thing it does is it causes you to lose trust in God by you placing your trust in the situation instead of in his promises. We begin to focus all of our energy, all of our thoughts on the situation at hand instead of the promises at hand. And the last thing that worry does, worry can actually cause you to be physically sick. It can cause your body to be physically sick. So worry has a lot of power in our life the same way that faith has a lot of power in our life. And just as we listed these four things this morning that worry could do, faith does the same, but it does the opposite of those things. Faith does the opposite. And I love that in this passage here, the word that Jesus used in this, he says, do not allow it to dominate your thoughts. And I really feel that's what worry does for us. Or what maybe for you, worry looks like frustration. Maybe it looks like anger. Maybe it looks like fear, anxiety. But whatever that thing is for you that worry shows its ugly face as, it, it really comes into our life and wants to dominate our life. It really wants to come in and take center stage of our life and have everything revolved around it. And that's why I think that Jesus was so certain here. He says, don't let your thoughts be taken away by this. Instead, have your faith-filled thoughts that are aligned with my promises. Don't be distracted by this worry because then you'll be dominated by fear and you'll be weak at hand. You'll be weak for the kingdom cause that he's called you to. So he says, don't let worry distract you. Don't let worry pull you away. And I love that the, the apostle Paul here, he points out, because I think sometimes in our life we go, how do we know if we're being dominated by things that aren't right in our mind? How do I know what's worry and what wisdom is? How do I know? Well, here's what Paul says in the book of Timothy. He says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 
So you can tell pretty easily if what you're, you're letting your mind marinate on is worry or if it's faith, because if it's worry, there will be fear behind it. But if it's faith that you're marinating on, it will give you power, love, and a sound mind. That'll be the telltale sign is the power and the love and the sound mind. And it's so important what we think, what we allow to go on play by play in our mind all day long. We all have a loop that we play. Some of us, it's a faith-filled loop about God's promises and we're speaking to the situation at hand and telling that situation what to do. But for some of us, we have a loop that plays in our mind. And for some of us, it's a what if loop. For some of us, the loop is, is it what if I don't get the money I need and I lose my job and my family has a hard time eating this month? For some of us, the loop is what if I forgive that person and they come and they take advantage of me again and I never wanna be hurt like that again. What if I let people get too close again? I can't stand to be hurt the way I was before. What if it's this what if loop that plays in our mind? And what I begin to think about is the, the what if scenario and the things that we think about every day and the things that are going on. You know, our thoughts and our words are really just seeds that we are planting today to harvest tomorrow. They're just seeds that we're planting in our life to, to harvest tomorrow. And so today, the title of today's message I wanna talk about is what's in your garden? What's in your garden? What kind of seeds are you planting in your garden to reap the harvest on tomorrow? You know, recently, uh, this message is, is kind of fresh for me because I have, I've had a bad loop lately. There's been a situation that I've been going through and it's probably been one of the most trying situations of my entire life. And I'll tell you some good news about it. Man, my faith in this season has been the highest it's ever been. I have never prayed more powerful prayers in my life. I have never stood so strong on the word of God of my entire life. I have never sang to champion like I have in this season of my entire life. You should just be in my car. Like it has been such a faith-filled season for me because I've been being pushed to the edge on a situation and I have just had to really just stand firm in my faith and stand strong. And it seems like this situation, there's moments when I'm standing and I feel the power of God. I feel what Paul talked about. I feel power and love and I feel a sound mind. But there's these moments that I go through where I feel like this situation is totally encompassing me. And it's overtaking me. Have any of you been there before in your life? When there's those, those moments that you feel so strong on what God said and you're like, okay, I'm getting through this. And then just a few minutes later, you're out of breath and pacing because you're so overwhelmed by the anxiety or the frustration or the fear that this situation is, is causing you. And I've been going through this season several months ago where I felt both. I felt the strongest faith I've ever felt, but simultaneously I felt the strongest fear I've ever felt. And I begin to question what's going on. I begin to question my faith. I've been able to, I've been able to question God's faithfulness even in this season. And what I begin to realize is even though I have sown the strongest seeds of faith that I may have ever sown in my entire life, if I'm honest, from every prayer that I said, for every word I said, for every scripture I quoted, and I took authority over the devil, I would dare to say there were probably 10 thoughts or 10 conversations or 10 Google searches that did just the opposite. And I would plant these seeds of faith and then I would immediately go and plant something else in my garden that didn't belong there. And it wasn't that my faith wasn't working. It wasn't that my faith wasn't there and my faith wasn't spreading good seeds. It was that I was covering my faith in things that would destroy it. I was covering my faith in things in my life that would try to choke out the faith that I had planted in my life. Recently at my house, I, I started gardening and I'm gonna say that very modestly because it's not really a garden. It's like three vases with some peppers in it that I don't know how to cook with. And so I have these peppers that I'm babysitting with my son and they're growing and it's, it's worked out really well. And he's been really trying to encourage me, like let's do an all out garden. But I know when you do a garden, there's some things that are really important. And I think one of the most important things about establishing a garden is to make sure that your soil is right. 
You've gotta build that garden in a place where it's going to have good soil and it's going to be protected. In my particular neighborhood, we have bunnies everywhere. So I know that I have to have the garden at a certain height so the bunnies can't get it. It's gotta be fenced in a proper way. But I know that that soil has gotta be right. And that soil has got to be clean because I know that when I go to, to plant this garden, if the conditions aren't right, it doesn't matter how many good things I plant. What really matters is how many bad things I let in. And I wanna illustrate this for you guys this morning. I, I have a little Joanna Gaines gig this morning. I wanted to wear an apron, but my husband said that was too far. But I was thinking about the seeds that we plant in our life. See, we all have these seeds we plant of faith. And I feel like in this series, if you're like me, you've been sitting here and you've been looking at things in your life and you've been looking for things that you want God to come through in for your life. Like Pastor West shared this morning, last week for him it was his finances and he began to speak hope and life over his finances. I think for some of us, maybe it's your relationships. Maybe it's your marriage and your marriage has been on the rocks and so you've been in this season and you've been in this series going, you know what, I'm gonna plant seeds that say my marriage is rooted and grounded in the truths of God. Me and my spouse both love the Lord. Our family serves God. As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. There's unity in this household and where there's unity, God commands a blessing. For some of you, maybe it's a relationship that you've lost and you wanna regain, someone in your family or someone in your past. And, and in this season, you said, God, you can bring back together and you can put the restore or restore of brokenheartedness and relationships and the devil can't break anything that you've meant to put together. So you've planted these seeds and as you sing champion and as you sing these prayers here in service, you plant all these good, good relationship seeds. You speak the words, you pray and you trust God. For some of you guys, it's been with your finances like Pastor West talked about this morning. It's going, you know what, I'm a giver and I'm a tither. And because of that, I'm planting these seeds to know that my finances are taken care of by God. I'm planting all these good seeds in the ground. I'm gonna stand firm on the word. God, you said to test me in this. So God, I'm putting you to the test. I'm gonna be a giver. I'm gonna trust you. The Bible says trust in the Lord with all your heart. So God, I am trusting in you, God. I'm not gonna worry. I'm not gonna fear fear. God, I'm going to trust in you. Some of you in this season, maybe it looks like your past. Maybe it looks like your, your past mistakes and things that you've messed up on. But the Bible says I can forget the former things because God is doing a new thing in my life. So you are planting these seeds of hope. You are planting these seeds to know that I press towards the mark of the goal that God has before me. God, I know that no man can stop what you've created in my life. There's no power in hell that can stop me. And you're planting these amazing seeds in your life. For some of you guys, maybe it's past hurts. And you're going like, you know what, God, I'm gonna stay truthful and I'm gonna stand firm in your word and I'm gonna know that, that you're a healer, you heal the brokenhearted, God, you're gonna restore my life. I don't have to hold on to this hurt, God. You're gonna heal me in this season. We are planting some good things. For some of us, it's our health. We've been concerned about our health. Maybe we've gotten a bad doctor's report. And so in this season, we say, no, I walk in victory and in health. No matter what that report is, I don't care. I'm planting these seeds of health and hope in my life. I'm getting better every single day. I'm getting stronger. By his stripes, I'm healed. God is a healer. And I don't care if I've had this before. This affliction will not come on me a second time. You are speaking the word for your healing. For some of you, it's your future. You've been concerned about your future. Where am I going to college? What's happening with my job? What's happening? Are we gonna be able to have this baby that I've been believing God for? God, I'm concerned about my future, but I, I know that the Bible says that you have plans for me, plans that give me hope and a future. You have a plan for me. My best days are ahead. I'm walking in victory. God's opening doors that no man can shut. Have y'all been having some moments like this lately? When you're sitting here and you're worshiping, you're going, but God, but God said, but God said. See, I've been having these moments too. But sometimes in these moments, what I begin to realize is as many good seeds of faith and hope and authority in what the word of God says and authority in the promises that he's given me. Sometimes as many seeds of hope that I have planted, I've come right behind it and just thrown some weeds in my garden. How many of you would go and you would plant a garden and just go, you know what, I'm gonna throw a little, little crabgrass in my garden? I know I've been believing God for this relationship to be better, but did you see what he did today? 
Let me tell you, I've got to call my sister. I've got to call my cousin. I've got to get on social media because let me tell you what he did today. You know what? That doctor's report, it was just, just as bad as I thought it would be. My health is just not getting any better. Let me, let me WebMD this one more time. Let me think about this. What was that? Is that my elbow hurting? What is elbow a sign of? Is this a sign that I'm dying because I have elbow pain? I'm just so fearful in my life. And then, oh my God, my future. I just, I, I, I've been watching the news lately and I'm just so concerned and I don't know what's gonna happen this year. I don't know what's happening with COVID. I don't know what's happening with the economy. I don't know what's gonna happen with my job. And I'm just so nervous and I just wish I could talk to my mom right now because my mom could help me figure this out. And I'm just so fearful of my life right now. And what I begin to realize in my life is I would plant all these seeds and it would be like just coming right behind planting a fresh garden full of fresh seeds and going right behind yourself and planting crabgrass and all these terrible weeds that would grow up just to choke out the seeds of faith and hope that you've planted. And I began to realize even as a pastor, if I'm not careful and if I'm not guarding my thoughts, it's very easy for me with all of my spiritual wisdom and all of the promises that God's given me and all the time that I've spent in my life memorizing the word of God and knowing the promises that he said, I noticed if I'm not careful, not only will I let the weeds in my garden, but I'll come and I'll plant them myself. I'll come and I'll plant them myself. And I think sometimes we like to like let our weeds masquerade as wisdom. Oh, no, 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 this is just wisdom. It's wisdom to put my walls up and make sure that I don't let people in my life beckon to hurt me. No, it's wisdom for me to Google and WebMD symptom check 37 times today. It's wisdom, I'm just getting ahead of the game. So how do we know if it's weeds or if it's wisdom? Well, planning for tomorrow is wisdom, but worrying about tomorrow is fear. And what I've realized is that worry causes you to get in this loop. Worry immobilizes you where wisdom will move you. So if it's really wisdom from God in the situation that you're stressed over and you're thinking about all the time, if the thoughts are really from God, they're going to give you power. They're going to give you a sound mind. They're going to feel like wisdom and you're going to know the step to take. But the things in our life that causes us to be immobilized and just to go in circles, to play the same loop again and again and again, and if what you're thinking about and what you're marinating on and what you're letting settle on you, if you don't know what to do, then it's not wisdom, it's weeds. And so you ask Pastor Stephen, what is it that I'm supposed to do with these weeds in my life? What do I do with these weeds? And I asked James if he would come up here for a minute. I'm gonna let him play God for a minute, but just for a minute. Don't get this to your head, babe. (laughs) But we asked, say, God, then what do I do with these weeds? If I don't want these weeds in my garden, here's here's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5. It says to pour out your worries and your stresses and leave them for me, because I care about them. To dump them out, to dump them out on God. Not in your garden. God's got it, trust God. But not to dump them in your garden. It says, cast all your cares on me, because I care for you. Just cast them on me. Well, I don't want to bring God my bad. I bring God my best and I bring my God on Sunday. I bring him my best. I breathe him my tithe. I would never bring him my worries. But you know when we cast our cares and worries on him, it's one of the most vulnerable and pure places we can be in our walk with God. When we go, God, I'm not gonna hold on to these concerns. I don't wanna take them to my cousin or my sister or to social media. Instead, God, I wanna bring these to you. And that's what the Bible tells us. It says, don't worry. Instead, pray without ceasing. So that doesn't mean that the worries and the fears that you have, you just have to not have those anymore. What it means though is instead of taking them to yourself, instead of taking them to Google, instead of taking them to your cousin, just take those worries to God. Tell him about your worries. Tell him about your troubles. Cast those cares on him, but then go and plant faith in your garden. 
Let him strengthen you so that you can go and you can plant these seeds of faith in your garden. So I feel like the real key in our life is to find ways to increase our faith but decrease our worry. How can we live a life that increases faith and decreases our worry? And this morning, I wanna go through really quick three things that will help us to defeat worry and fear in our life. First thing I wanna talk about this morning is that we focus on his promises. If you wanna defeat worry and fear, you focus on his promises. Not the promises of people around you, not what they promised last night on CNN was gonna happen with the economy, not what somebody on Facebook promised was gonna happen because they shared this post that they saw, not that promise, but the promise that he says, the promise that he said in his word or the promise that he said to you, to focus on those promises. Paul says it this way, whatever's true, honest, lovely, noble, of good report, think on these things. Think of them, those things, the things that cause our hearts to be pure and our hearts to be at peace and our heart to be hopeful because we know that there's a power that lives inside us and we know that greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world. So we don't have to focus on that. Instead, we get to focus on the promises of God. And let me give you a little tip here. Don't let something in if you can't control the tone of it. Don't get up first thing in the morning and go to social media if you know every day when you get on social media, it puts you in a bad mood, if it puts you in a place of fear or frustration or worry, then don't let it in. But sometimes I think we actually go and we get as many weeds as we can to put in our basket to go plant in our garden. And that's crazy, right? If you were building a garden at your home and I said, well, I'm a new gardener, come and ask me what to do, and I would tell you, yes, go all over your yard and find the nasty patches of crabgrass and all the yucky things in your yard, the weeds that are growing, pick them all up, put them in your basket, then take them into your garden and sprinkle them all around, right? We would never do that, yet we do that every day of our life when we allow worry to come in our garden. When we go and we open up the door to the negative, we open up our door to the frustration and we allow that to come into our lives. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on his promise. The second thing that we're gonna do, I'm actually pulling out of the passage that Jesus said about worry. He said this, he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. I think sometimes we carry a lot of worry, we carry a lot of fear because instead of seeking his priorities, we seek ours. But you can't seek your priorities and have his peace. If you wanna have his peace, you gotta seek his priorities. And that's what it says here. It says when you seek first the kingdom, if you're really worried about your relationships, your marriage, your kids, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, I promise you that if you seek first his kingdom and your relationship, you will have the kind of relationship that God's designed for you when you seek him first. If you're really, really worried about your finances or your job situation or things going home, I promise you, if you seek your job and you seek your finances the way that the word of God tells you to, you will have exactly what you need. When you seek first the kingdom, you're a better parent, you're a better spouse, you're a better student, you're a better child. When you seek first the kingdom of God. And I think sometimes it's easy for us while we're playing our garden to forget that this is God's garden and he's the one that gives us the nutrients. And we begin putting all these things in our garden and then we're mad at God because the garden doesn't look like what we wanted, but we're the ones who brought in the weeds. We're the ones that brought in the crops that we weren't trying to harvest. And our garden looks different than the garden that he's designed for us because we're not seeking first his will. Third thing I wanna talk about this morning is looking for his fruit. I think sometimes we're focused on the wrong thing. I think sometimes instead of focusing on his fruit, we're focused on not failing. We look at a situation and we're so scared to fail. We're so scared the situation's not gonna turn out what we like. We're so scared of losing control that instead of focusing on him and focusing on the fruit and the thing he's trying to do right now, the new thing he's trying to do, instead we just resist because we're so fearful of where this is going to go. We're so fearful of the failure. We're so fearful of the situation at hand that we're not able to control instead of really focusing on the fruit. 
And I think there's always fruit available for us. I think there's always fruit that we can see when we have eyes to see it. But I think sometimes we're just not looking for the fruit. We're just looking for the failure. We're looking for the frustration. We're looking for the fear instead of looking for the fruit. And it reminds me of a story in the Bible out of Numbers. There was, a, there was the chosen people of God and he was taking them. He promised them years ago. He promised, he made a covenant to Abraham years and years before that he would take these people to the promised land, this perfect land flowing with milk and honey. These people that had been in captivity and that were slaves were gonna go to this beautiful promised land. So, so Moses along with thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are on their way to the promised land and God says, here's what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to send 12 spies out. I want you to send these 12 spies into this land so they can come back with a report. They can come back and they can tell us what's in the land. So Moses gathered a spy, a man from each tribe and sent them to this promised land. A few days later, they came back with their reports and 10 of them had the same report. 10 of them had a report that said this. They said there was some really amazing fruit. It was a really beautiful land. Man, they they saw it. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. They saw the fruit, the biggest grapes, the biggest fruits you've ever seen before. They saw it all. But what else they saw was they saw the giants in the land. They said next to these guys, we were like grasshoppers in the land. These, These giants were huge. They would kill us all. They would destroy us. And even though God made a promise and told us this was our promised land, There's no way we're getting into this land because it's just too hard. But there were two spies that said, I ain't putting no weeds in my garden. Names were Joshua and Caleb. And Joshua and Caleb says, ah, no, what they said is true. It's an amazing land. It's a land full of abundance. It's a land full of amazing fruit. And guess what? If we go right now, we can go and we can take this land. You know why? Because God said, I don't care what the situation looks like. I don't care who's there. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how tough they are. My God said that we can go because this is ours. This is our land. And so they come back with these two different reports. One report gave plenty of reasons to enter, but couldn't stop focusing on the fear. So they never made the step to go enter in the promised land. But these two guys, Joshua and Caleb said no. No, we're standing on the promise. And not only are we standing on the promise of what the faith that God says, but we're putting our faith into action. Not one word of of, of fear, not one word of failure would come out of our mouths. No, we're only going to speak hope and life. You know, in Proverbs 4, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. I wonder how much death that we speak around us to situations when we need to vent Are we speaking death to people around us? But I think even more importantly, how much death do we speak to ourselves? Do we look at situations like the spies do and go, man, I know that God said this and I have faith on Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, I'm just filled with fear and I'm just littering my garden full of all these weeds that are choking out every bit of faith I put in. And maybe you're going, God, I've been believing for this thing and believing for this thing and I'm not seeing any growth. Well, maybe you're like the spies. Maybe you can see the good thing that God wants to do, but you're not making the step to go and get that. And instead, you're surrounding yourself with the fear and the doubt. Life and death are in the power of your words and the power of your thoughts, right here in what you tell yourself. It's what's standing between you and the destiny that God has for you. Only two people made it into that promised land. Of all those hundreds of thousands of people and all the spies that went that day, only two people made it out of that group. Joshua and Caleb. Because of the power of the words that they decided to speak. The power of the faith that they would have. And they'd go, God, we're trusting you no matter what. We're trusting in your promise. And it doesn't matter how scary the situation looks, how big the giants look, how hard the situation is gonna be for us to do. It doesn't matter because God, you said, and our faith is in you. God, I've got way more faith in you than I've got fear over there. 
I mean, worry is not gonna have its way in me. Today is a day of faith for me. And God, I'm gonna trust in your promises. So only two people made it to the promised land. Only two people made it to their destiny. I wonder how many times in our life we look at our lives and we're so unsettled and we don't like where God has us, but I wonder how many times in our life it's because we aren't making the choices to get to that promised land. Instead of trusting in what God said and having that faith to believe, we're stepping back and we're going, everybody else says play it safe. Everybody else says this is the way it's gonna be. Everyone else says 2020 is just gonna keep getting worse. It's gonna be the worst year we've ever had. Everybody else says. But sometimes to get to the promised land, to get where you think God's called you to go, you're gonna have to go against the grain. You're gonna have to go against what everybody says, what everybody feels, and you're gonna have to have a faith that refuses to worry. Because it's worry that's draining your strength to go and fight the good fight of faith. It's worry that's covering up his promises and choking out what he said, and it's covering it up because you're believing what everybody else says. You're believing what your friend says or what the news says. It's worry that's covering it up. It's worry that's often preventing our purpose. It's that worry. And I'm gonna invite you guys to stand with us this morning. And we're gonna continue on with this faith series because I really believe that in this season, God has something great for you. When it seems like the seasons that are the scariest or the toughest or the hardest, sometimes that's the season that God is the most at work. It's just, what are you focused on? Are you focused on the fruit or are you focused on the failure? And I know this morning even I sat in a service and I thought, man, I hated not having servers for a couple of months. But since we've been back, there's been such a desperation in worship. There's been such a cry to have God move in this place and people desperately seeking God's face. And I sat on the front row this morning and I thought, man, I'd do, I'd do 20 more days or 20 more missed services of COVID for these worship experiences because there's always fruit. Anything the devil means for evil, God turns to good. There's always fruit. You just gotta look for that fruit. You gotta find it. Thanks so much for watching with us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the message. We always wanna give you an opportunity to be a part of what God is doing here. So if you'd like to give, you can text Ellis Church to 77977 or head to our website at ellischurch.tv. Again, thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.